So, let's talk about wind power, shall we? You're the boss. Let's go. Moving right along, we're going to learn about Titan's great natural resources. Titan is rich with hydrocarbons like methane and ethane. Surely you saw huge pools of the stuff on your descent into New Homestead. I like to think they add to the natural beauty of this world. Though of course, stay away from them because, like anything beautiful, they can be dangerous. Just like my last ex-wife's pet. <laughs> Jim is gorgeous. Oh, I don't know what you'd call it. Creature. <laughs> the guy that sold it to her couldn't tell her what it was or where it was from. I don't think it was even a legal sell, to be honest. The thing was very easy on the eyes. Feathers, all the colors of the rainbow. Nasty bite, though. Wound up in the hospital and almost lost my hand. Still not enough for her to get rid of the dang thing. <laughs> anyway. There's a reason she's my ex-wife. But enough about me. <laughs> we were talking about methane and other resources, right? Hey, can you believe it? Back in the 20th century on Earth, they used to fight wars over natural resources like this and petroleum. They had this whole moon here basically made of hydrocarbons in their own backyard. They just couldn't get to it. Incredible how far we've come. New Homestead is home to one of the oldest and largest methane processing plants in the settled system. Every year, UC engineers go through a painstaking, month-long maintenance process. It's how this place has remained operational as long as it has. I'm not going to take you too close to the machinery, liability and all, but I can still answer questions. Questions? Fire away! <laughs> yeah, it's not as if they shut down for a month. It's not shut down at all, actually. See, this place is built with redundant systems, so they can shut it down piece by piece and suffer only a reduction in throughput. During that time, the UC gets more of its resources from other places, allowing New Homestead to maintain what it needs. Exports mostly, since this world is so methane rich and has the infrastructure for it, a lot of the UC's methane comes from Titan. Of course, New Homesteaders use it themselves for everything from generating heat to turning it into breathable oxygen by a modern science. Oh, uh, no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> I, uh, hmm. uh, something to do with methane-eating microbes, I believe? I honestly don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Take your time. Uh, but not too much time. Don't want to keep other customers waiting, you know.
Do you need me to carry anything? We used to get more. You get used to the methane processing smell. After a while. history here. often get into trouble not watching where they step. Another tourist come to learn about the ice mines, huh? It's dangerous in the ice mines. I'd much rather answer your questions than have you going off to explore on your own. For one, New Homestead is not a wealthy colony. But we also pride ourselves on doing things the old ways. Part of the living history, they say. We don't mind. We work hard here. It's very rewarding. For drinking water. And we use some of it to produce this air you're breathing. We recycle a lot of what we use, but we still need a nice, steady supply of fresh water. Lucky for us, Titan provides. I'm surprised I still get this question. It's slippery. It's sharp, it can break, it can cave in. Those are just the obvious examples. Titan is also full of methane, which can sometimes be trapped under the ice. As you know, methane can explode under the right conditions. It can also asphyxiate you if you breathe in too much of it. Ah, so you can relate. It's good to talk with someone who understands the challenges of the job. Not everyone does. If I might ask, what do you mind? Oh, that's not what I expected at all when you said you didn't mind it. But uh, visions, you say? That sounds more like what those people get up to in Neon, from what I understand. Anyway, I'm sure we could swap mining stories all day, but uh, I really should be getting back to what I was doing soon. Stay safe.
questions? Fire away! <laughs> Okie dokie, artichokey. There will be time for more later anyway. So, this next stop is a bit of an interesting one. I only recently made it part of the tour. Fun fact, it's also the only natural landmark on the tour. What we're about to see is a glacial spire we affectionately call Emir's Horn. This colis used to be named after a character in a popular fantasy novel, but it was changed a couple hundred years ago to avoid any potential litigation. Now, what's a colis, you might say? Colis derives from the Latin word for hill, and scientists only gave names to groups of hills on a planet's surface. So in reality, the term you hear more often is the plural, colis, with an E. You probably don't hear it very often where you're from, because it was usually a term reserved for unexplored planets back when they didn't have the technology to describe what they were seeing firsthand. Because of that, the term is much more common in the soul system, but you may still hear it occasionally in reference to uncharted worlds. This planet's full of them, though, and they like to preserve that history here. So here it is, Emir's Horn. You're free to take a closer look if you like. According to ancient Norse mythology, Emir was the first Jotun, a frost giant. In the legend, they were both male and female and gave birth to the progenitors of all giants from their armpits. Ymir even predated the Norse gods, who, as it turns out, killed Ymir to fashion the Earth and all of humanity from the corpse. It's a fascinating story, and the horn here is a fitting tribute to it. How about that? You really know your stuff. Maybe you should be the one giving the tour. Ha! <laughs> I kid. I'm not sure. I heard someone say that before. Something about the worn-down remains of an ancient volcano producing ice via steam? I don't know. It sounds like you understand this stuff better than I do. Just be careful! It can get slippery out that way. <laughs> I'll wait here.
you need my help with something? Of course, Captain. I grew up in Hope Town on Polvo. It's a corporate town run by Ron Hope, the CEO of Hope Tech Manufacturing. Almost everyone who lives there works for him. It was a depressing place to grow up. Ron Hope talks a big game about providing for his workers, but the truth is that most of us can barely keep the lights on. I'm lucky that joining the Freestar Rangers got me out of there. It wasn't the kind of place I wanted to spend my life. The longer I spent with the Rangers, the more I started to feel like they serve the Freestar Collective's government more than its citizens. I couldn't make peace with the fact that an organization that claimed to stand for freedom and individuality let places like Hope Town exist. Eventually, the hypocrisy was too much. I made the decision to resign and move to the UC. Seemed like people there might share more of my views. It was the right decision, but it wasn't an easy one. My family is still in Hope Town. That was almost enough to keep me from leaving the Freestar Collective. But I had my mind set on finding a better place for all of us. I've been trying to find my parents a way out of Hope Town for years. I thought if I moved to the UC and found out things were better there, they might finally be willing to consider it. I thought I did at first. New Atlantis is clean and safe, and most of the people there are happy. And it seemed like the government was doing a lot to keep it that way. But my perspective changed after I took an entry-level job with UC Security. They stationed me in the well. I couldn't believe the conditions down there. It made all the UC talk of a perfect society seem like propaganda. The more I started looking around, the more cracks I saw in the whole thing. The UC makes a show of promising job placement and housing options to all its citizens. But if those programs exist in the well, there's no sign of them. Most people down there live in the same conditions I saw in Hope Town. There's crime and unemployment, and a lack of good medical care. It's nothing like the rest of New Atlantis. But you'd never know that from the outside, of course. Their treatment of the soul system to begin with. It's one of humanity's greatest treasures. And they've let it fall into total disarray. The UC's insistence on maintaining a large and well-equipped military is also a bit off-putting. If they're committed to intergalactic peace, why do they need it? Those are the kinds of questions you almost never hear UC citizens ask. 
I think that comes down to good marketing on Nast's part. It all seems just a little bit too shiny when you really start to look closely, huh? I'm glad I'm not the only one who thinks so. Once the wool fell from my eyes, living in New Atlantis lost its luster. That's when I decided life in the major factions wasn't for me. The problems run too deep. There's corruption and division everywhere. And not enough people are willing to see it. I don't think that will change anytime soon. It seems to me like the only option is starting over, huh? Founding a colony without the influence of massive governments and corporations. Maybe... Maybe people would be kinder to each other in a place like that. You read my mind, Captain. You're really getting to know me, huh? I've been thinking about the idea of founding my own settlement for a while. It isn't in my nature to sit around while the problems in the settled systems get worse. But I'm not rushing into anything. If I'm really going to do this, I need to get a better sense of how people live all over the settled systems. That means visiting the major cities and looking at both the good things and the bad. That way, I can decide what things I want to keep and what I am going to leave behind. Good thing I'm working for a captain that likes to travel, huh? We'll hit all the major cities in no time. I appreciate it. And don't you worry, I won't let this distract me from my normal duties. You're still the boss. Got places to be, huh?
So here it is, Emir's horn. You're free to take a closer look if you like. Excellent. On to the next stop then. So we're gonna head back inside through the methane processing plant. Try not to touch anything on your way. We want to make sure to respect Dr. Lakota's wishes to be safer around here. Ah, that brings me to another point. You'll notice the people around here have last names related to where their families originated from on Earth as a way to remember the past. The museum curator, Maurice Leon, has more information about that if you're interested. You can find him inside the main concourse. Loves talking about him. You'll find most of the locals here are very friendly to tourists like yourself. Tourism is a major draw to this colony these days, and they respect that. Most of them are happy to talk at length about what they do here. Their rugged lifestyle is a point of pride for a lot of these folks. This area we're walking through is the nerve center of the plant, where technicians keep an eye on the operation. Since methane production is such an important part of the colony's livelihood, it's important that the techs notice any issues and react to them quickly. Anyway, we're headed into the ice mines. It's a natural spring where water bubbles up from deep below, but due to the cold, it keeps freezing as it reaches the surface. tell you about the ice mines. I wouldn't recommend it. First, it's an active work site. Second, it still needs to be filtered and checked for contaminants. But don't worry, we'll stop somewhere for refreshments before the tour is over. Good question. I believe it has something to do with not wanting to contaminate the water with methane and other chemicals. The ice helps prevent impurities in the water. At least this is what I've been told. Not all. Some water is created as a byproduct of methane processing, but that's usually saved in the emergency reserves. Sounds good. Let's keep going then. We have just one more stop before we're done with the tour, and it just happens to be my favorite. This colony is home to the longest running establishment still in existence, the Brown Horse Tavern. The Brown Horse started as a simple mess hall for the scientists and workers when the underground was built, but it's been operated by the same family ever since. Now, what's a horse, you might say? They were a large four-legged animal on Earth, often used for transportation or manual labor. Long before space travel was even a dream to the folks of Earth, even before antique machines like automobiles were possible, horses could be found everywhere. You might have seen them in old movies or read about them somewhere. If not, I highly recommend looking into them sometime. They're beautiful animals. The tavern's original owner was infatuated with them, from what I understand, and named the place in their honor. 
The moniker, Brown Horse Tavern, is also a throwback to names of similar Earth restaurants hundreds of years before it was established. That delicious smell is making me hungry. <laughs> Can I answer anything about the Brown Horse? Anya Seattle is the current owner of the Brown Horse. It's been in the Seattle family for generations. But Anya will be able to tell you more herself. Feel free to ask her. It doesn't feel right coming from me when she's standing right over there. Ooh, that's a tough one. I honestly love everything Anya serves here. I'd be doing her a disservice to recommend one dish over another. You want the real answer? Order one of everything. <laughs> Easy. All the other ones fell to ruin when we abandoned Earth. There were technically older ones on Mars, but those have long since shuttered or been replaced. Oh yeah, by all means, stop in for a moment. Why not order some food and make yourself comfortable? Welcome, I'm Anya. Is this your first time with us at the Brown Horse Tavern? Oh, well, thank you for joining us. You're in for a real treat. We've got an assortment of food and drinks, some of which follow homemade recipes that have been passed down over hundreds of years. So what can I do for you? <laughs> oh, hardly. The locals pretty much stay away from chunks, so whenever they don't feel like cooking themselves and want a fresh meal, they come to me. Only the tourists eat that junk, but, but don't tell that to my husband. He manages the chunks. I love him, but he's a bit of a fanatic about it. You mean the brown horse? Well, it's only the longest continuous running restaurant since humans started settling outside of Earth. There's a lot of history within these walls. And some damn fine food and drink, if I say so myself. This place has been in my family for generations. My great-great, the uh, however many, great-grandmother opened it when the first colony started on Titan. Back then, it was a simple mess hall that she chose to put a little extra love and flavor into. And now, it's the pride of New Homestead. So Let me show you what we have. Churn our own butter. Hope you'll be I back sometime. I bought it. <laughs> you didn't. I did. I know I shouldn't have, but I just wanted to if see how they react. If you need medical react. attention, see Dr. Lacosta. But for the morning, she really does. Sure it would be nice to be And they already so. believe. That's a good it's a point. Weird that they already gawk at us like we're some sort of ancient curiosity. That delicious oh, smell is making me out. hungry. <laughs> Can I answer anything okay. about the brown horse? Okay then. All right, we're headed to the last stop, right back where we began. Feel free to check out the museum exhibit in the main concourse here. These displays are full of rare earth trinkets salvaged from before humanity left, and Maurice is happy to talk about the collection. The museum's curator, Maurice, will be happy to talk to you if you want to know more. Well, that's that. I hope you enjoyed Star Sap Tours as much as I enjoy giving them. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, wow. I, I really appreciate it. You know, I rely on tips from good people like you, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your stay in New Homestead. Take care! Thank <laughs> you.